And it happened right here. Um, this is a shot from the Talent Mobile Estates in Talent, Oregon, my hometown. Um, and I guess I need to back up just a little bit and say that the day before, September 8th, Labor Day 2020, was a really big day in the Rogue Valley. And if you were here on that day, even if you didn't lose your home, and even if you did, Ian, uh, you are fire affected. So that morning, shortly after 11, the first calls came in uh, about a, a, a brush fire in, along the Bear Creek Greenway. And uh, by the end of the day, it had really devastated our community. First, I went into Ashland, got my folks out of their house, and then I went home and I packed up my stuff and got out. Uh, and then we all went to Medford. And that night, um, as I was watching the glow of my hometown burning, um, we got another evacuation notice for level two get ready. And we'd just gotten all the animals and family and everyone out. So I really consider that day just deeply, deeply painful and uh, full of a lot of trauma. But I woke up the next morning and I realized I was really sick of running, right? I've been running all the day before. So I went back into town, into my hometown. Um, and I'm carrying this, this, uh, this paper because we got a lot to get through and a very little time to do it. So if I have to check it, just realize I'm just trying to keep myself on task. But when I drove back into town, Oregon, I realized that everything had changed, right? We had lost 2,500 homes. Um, we had lost 21 manufactured home parks, primarily full of seniors, folks who spoke Spanish primarily. We'd have, you know, in the Phoenix Elementary School, 80% of the children had been displaced. It was just a huge, huge uh, devastation. Um, we'd really lost the economic coal, the workforce, the naturally occurring affordable housing in the valley, um, the things that, you know, made this lunch, the people that cleaned it up afterwards, the folks that make the beds here, the folks that, um, you know, act in Shakespeare, make Shakespeare ready. Our whole economy was impacted and our whole community was really you know, heavily impacted. Um, so when I went back into town, I did what I could, right? I grabbed my fire trail, I went and started putting out fires. The police station here, there, burning creosote logs, et cetera, and I found myself spraying this pile of burning asbestos. And I really had to then ask myself, well, is this my highest purpose in this space? And my background is not in uh, firefighting. I'm not a firefighter. Um, but the answer to that was no. And so from that, I formed a long-term recovery organization, a nonprofit with a mission to support community solutions for long-term recovery, preparedness, and resilience in the face of natural disasters. And it's called Firebrand. Um, that's a really big mission. Thanks. That was the easy part, right? <laughs> Starting an organization is easy, but doing the actual work is really hard. So that was the easy part. Um, it's a big, big mission with you know, trying to face an even bigger problem. Um, and so we needed to start with some definitions. So like, what is the definition of resilience? Go ahead on that one. So we adopted this one from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Resilience is the ability of a system and its component parts to anticipate, absorb, accommodate, or recover from the effects of a hazardous event in a timely and efficient manner, including through ensuring the preservation, restoration, or improvement of its essential basic structures and function. That was a two or three breath sentence, right? Um, it's really complex when you get onto the ground. Um, in our recovery, that involved lots of partners, lots of agencies. The fire does not respect boundaries, so it burned off across five different jurisdictions with uh, competing priorities. And since it was our first disaster, our first wildfire, we really only had, famous phrase, the concept of a plan, right? And so you have to overlay all of that against a really very rich and deep layer of, of community trauma, individual trauma and community trauma. Um, go to the next one there. This one is a real wake-up call. These are sort of the phases of disaster, right? You can see the pre-disaster, the impact, the heroic response, the honeymoon phase, the disillusionment, the reconstruction. Luckily, we're far along on the right here. But that roller coaster right there, I'm going to talk about a bit more um, and how sort of the uh, approach to, to uh, community resilience really involves a lot of you know, regenerative practice and whatnot. Um, that roller coaster is really very ripe for a meritocracy and ideas that work, innovation, everything is messed up, everything's fucked. So now we have to put it back together. How do we put it back together? Um, but what I started realizing, because my background, as I said, was not in disaster. It was in producing large music festivals. It was in journalism. It was in a, a, a different types of lifetime that kind of led me to that moment. But it's a one-to-one -one skill set with disaster recovery, with refugee crises, with... Um, with uh, wildfire event production is, um, because you're dealing with displaced populations that have the same needs, the same human needs. Um, but it was a really rich space for what can we do differently? That how do we get here and what can we do differently moving forward? Um, 
And one of the wonderful things about wildfire and disaster is that a lot it's happened, and you have communities who share their lessons. They shared their lessons with me, with us, and now we're honored to share it with other communities like Maui, like Lahaina, like other places that are you know, even today burning. Um, so one of the lessons that was passed on to us from Sonoma and from uh, Paradise was the idea of a block or zone captain systems, and that really is just making sure that survivors are part of the decision-making space, that they're lifted up and empowered to be part of their own recovery and be the agents of change. Um, so that was, had always been a volunteer program, and we were able to luckily improve that system by employing them, by finding public dollars to actually employ survivors in the recovery over time. And we did that, we, we created uh, standard operating procedures, we created best practices, we identified obstacles in sort of like, you know, in trauma care and how do you speak to people from a lot of different backgrounds and, and, and move them forward through the recovery. So again, we're able to share that with, uh, with other communities today. Um, but the other part we did was data collection that hadn't been done before. So we have really tracked every single interaction over the last four years, every email, phone call, conversation we've had with survivors, and how did that track over time, and then how can we you know, build tools that show it, right? Because there's a lot of talk about um, it would be so good if. Well, let's actually show it over time. So data collection has been a really big part of, and analysis has been a really big part of our work. Um, the program, the Zone Captains program, has done a lot of really cool stuff. It's, uh, you know, informed uh, legislation, policy. Uh, it's made resource programs a lot more accessible. It's helped out community, uh, really, in overcoming immense obstacles at every level. Um, but one story I like to tell is of our, of our current program manager, Cass Cornwell. She was a fire survivor, lived with her sister. Uh, their home burned down. They went to their folks' house. Their folks' home burned down. Uh, and they were able to all get in one house for a year. Now, Cass is neurodivergent, um, and she really didn't get out of bed for a year. And then she heard about that there was a group of survivors, and they were all kind of lifting each other up. And she came out to one of the meetings, and um, from that has been, it, she kind of used what some would consider her disability as a superpower. She's basically a mintat. Uh, and every housing availability um, that happens across all these mobile home parks, all the different sort of data that we've been able to gather. She holds that data for a lot of different agencies now and shares it with them um, and tracks how our community is recovering. Um, today she's the you know, housing recovery co-director uh, with the Jackson County Long-Term Recovery Group and she's really a professional survivor and works on designing resource programs for recovery around the state. But this intersection of people and data uh, is in a disaster context is kind of like trench warfare. Um, the system's not really meant to uh, deal with so many different inputs, especially when the inputs are from community itself. And I don't really have an understanding or a clear picture of how exactly AI could have helped us along the way, because this stuff is so very deep, deeply relational, one-to-one, uh, -one, person to person. Um, but that's kind of why I'm here, right? That's why I'm here to learn. And uh, I do know what we did with our data. So if we, you know, before we got into all this community organizing, um, what we really needed was a map. If you want to go on to the next one, that'd be great. So there's my kid, right? And we're trying to draw from memory what we lost in the fire. Um, and driving through Talent Phoenix, it did not look at all like what it looked like before. So we're trying to remember what these manufactured home parks were called, what stores were here. It's all basically flat rubble. If you've ever been through a wildfire, there's nothing there. Um, so a lot of us got around a table and we drew it from memory and we had my kid kind of color it in. Um, and then really quickly we connected with like Esri, right? If y'all ever do GIS work, um, we connected with Esri and uh, they taught us that we didn't have to use these paper things, we could really take this a lot deeper into data mapping and data storytelling. So um, every wildfire, every disaster, the first thing that happens is a damage assessment. So you have FEMA and agencies coming in and saying, well, here's what you lost, right? Here's how many tax slots, here's how many homes. You know, here's the infrastructure that you lost. That's really useful, right, when you're trying to figure out how much it's going to cost to build back, but it's not so useful in a social context. So what we did was use that damage, as assessment, that damage assessment as the baseline and started telling our own stories uh, about how our community is recovering. That was the question we were really interested in is, how is our community recovering over time? Is it equitable? Do people have access to housing? Um, are there populations, demographics that are coming back slower or faster than others, and why is that? So uh, let's go to the next one over, oh wow, five minutes. All right, so two, 
two years later, we were able to come out with a really comprehensive dashboard that tracked all sorts of economic indicators, and we used per public permit data um, to look at, uh, you know, basically what neighborhoods and types were coming back. Is there a gap? Can we move the community conversation into filling that gap? Um, so that you can check all this out on our website, and you'll see a little QR code at the end to go check that out. Um, but essentially what we learned was relationships and data are really power. It's almost Promethean to be able to speak in this language to government, um, to planners, et cetera, and try to figure out how a community can recover even more. Um, I'm gonna just talk over this next one. Go ahead and play that one. Um, so four years later, we have programming that really spans the different phases of disaster, right? So from, rec from response to recovery to readiness. Um, and instead of a really complex definition of um, of resilience, we're kind of, I believe we're able to now sort of solve for resilience by uh, this last bit that'll come in here uh, is that, you know, response and recovery and readiness, right, there's the phases, plus the relationships, uh, a little bit long, equals resilience, you'll see this. Um, there we go. There's, 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 the, there's the, uh, the, the math equation. Um, so, we met with a lot of folks, this last phase of readiness, how do we prevent this kind of thing from happening? And we met with a lot of folks, academics, fire protection agencies, et cetera, um, to ask what is the gap? And the gap is who can hold community relationships over time and build those communities up? Um, my understanding of regenerative practice is really to create systems that recognize the full resource potential within themselves. Not extractive, but, a, uh, but nourishing how we can make impacted populations the agents of their own change. It's not prescriptive, it's adaptive, right? So our vision statement is creating resilient communities to better confront a changing climate by placing affected populations at the center of transformative action. So like the zone captains and the loss and recovery dashboard project, um, now we're really working on how do we prevent it again? How do we prepare communities and create more fire adapted communities? How can we leverage the relationships to, make, to create new community data? Uh, and we're working to do that through our latest program which is called Ready Now. The now stands for Neighborhoods Organized for Wildfire. And we're asking the questions, you know, how can we expand the definition of local knowledge um, to improve how our community recovers? We've asked that question. Um, as far as preparedness, a lot of folks are asking the question, um, how can we expand the definition of local knowledge to improve like incident response, initial attack during wildfires, um, and better protect the most valuable and vulnerable resources we have? Um, our schools, our people, our places, our animals, our infrastructure, our agriculture, all that kind of stuff. Um, others are working on how local knowledge can expand um, or you know, improve um, landscape treatments. That's something Kevin's going to get in here really soon. But how can we really come, you know, uh, to, to meet this really, in you know, this era of mega fires with better data, better community generated data, and involve those stories and those experiences in, um, in tackling the problem of wildfire. So the Ready Now program really works on building community, right? Firewise communities, we do free home assessments, we can do, we can provide resources, cost share programs to harden homes. Our, job is not really to uh, prevent the forest from burning, but to mitigate community loss um, from wildfire. So I really liked Gaia's question yesterday. Um, we incentivize climate collapse, but how can we incentivize climate adaptation? So that's really the heart of what we're trying to work on here. Um, AI is going to be part of our, 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 our work. We're not there yet. I'm still a novice. Um, we have a tool that uses a lot of machine learning in in, uh, in, in recognizing risk in communities and then you know, creating programs that kind of mitigate those. Um, one way to think about this and sort of the way to lead into Kevin's is to look at how nationally we think about wildfire. So you have uh, the fire adapted communities, all those things I circled are things that we do, but it's a really complex, rich environment to, to think about how you change, um, how you adapt communities to wildfire. Uh, the other, you know, we have to kind of zoom out a little bit further and look at sort of the national approach to wildfire. The next one is uh, sort of the, the national cohesive strategy. So we work in this upper circle, fire adapted communities. 
Um, others, your fire districts, your, your forestry departments, they all work in that other one, safe, effective, risk-based wildfire response, essentially suppression. And then the third one, which Kevin's again to, is the resilient landscape side. But like any sort of like tripod or you know, a three-legged stool, you can't put too much weight on one without the others collapsing. One of the reasons why we're in this area of megafires is because we've put so much time and money and energy into that one suppression place, right? We've lost indigenous fire. We've lost our relationship to fire on the landscape. We have um, been in an extractive process for timber for hundreds of years. We've had a cooler climate for, uh, you know, unseasonably in the, in, the, uh, in the Pacific Northwest for 100 years. We have massive fuels in our forests. Um, so they're starting to invest more in resilient landscapes. How do we heal? our forests, and then our work is really how can we work with communities, adapt them, and make sure that, uh, that, you know, we're, that, that uh, the data that we're gathering can be helpful in, in getting that across to more fire-adapted communities. Um, so really, that gives me the opportunity to turn it over to Kevin, who's really working on the resilient landscape side, and he's going to talk a lot bit more about AI, uh, I imagine, and I've been talking a little bit more about sort of regeneration and sort of the fired up community side. So thanks, there's my contact info, I'll be here for a bit. Yeah, man. Thank you. Um, I'm working on a slightly different angle on this, which has been on the sort of preventative side of things and couldn't agree with Tucker Moore around how much money has been thrown at the suppression side, uh, which has really damaged our landscapes in sort of unimaginable ways. Um, I come from the product innovation side of things, and uh, for about 20 years, I've been helping companies like Microsoft and TED conferences and all kinds of folks to create sort of their new generations of products and services. Um, but uh, it was interesting yesterday when Jay said, what was the big moment for you when sort of took a big left turn, and my big left turn came around wildfire. Um, and it came out of nowhere for me. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that story. Um, around 2017, the, the Park Fire and the Tubbs Fire happened in Northern California. They're massive. I'm sure you know a lot about them, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna reference those fires a little bit as a part of this talk. And so this is really about wildfire, and it's about data and AI. It's about ecosystem resilience and systems thinking and tools and models and how to use these things together to hopefully create a better world for all of us. Um, these, these fires in, uh, uh, in 2017 were massive, but in 2020, there was, uh, just as a data point, this is what happened. There was about $63 billion in public health impacts as a result of the smoke and inhalation, as well as the actual destruction. Um, there are estimated three to four trillion in ecosystem benefit losses. There's 2.3 billion in fire suppression costs. 20 years of lost profitability in the insurance industry. Um, I'm gonna, for a second, pause myself. I'm gonna come at you guys really fast right now, and I'm gonna take a, 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 a sort of rule or a playbook out of Micah's playbook here and ask for a little call and response, which is uh, I talk really fast uh, when I get excited about this stuff. And so the, the, the call and response is slow down, Kevin. <laughs> slow down, Kevin. Excellent, thank you. I need, I need the reassurance there. All right. All good, thank you. Yeah, I'm, go I'm going for it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was approached by a woman named Allison Wolf uh, in 2018, um, and she said, we have got to figure out a way to uh, better use data and um, information and uh, communications in order to get people to understand what's happening on these landscapes uh, and how to potentially fix the problem. And tech can't fix everything, but it sure can help in a lot of situations. And so instead of believing that we could just go work that out on ourselves, uh, we went and interviewed about 100 people um, and it was quite a process and extraordinarily eye-opening for me professionally. Um, and so this was land management, emergency services, forest ecology, fuels, meteorology, hydrology, wildlife biology, a huge swath of people, state level, federal level, um, local levels, and uh, very specifically as well through the Tahoe region, uh, which is very progressive around these things. We learned a ton. So what did we hear? We heard that uh, planning, predictive tools, monitoring, are the most important things, um, that they, they feel like they're shooting in the dark. Uh, lots of these plans take decades, um, which is inconceivable to me, um, and it's paper being walked around in some of these organizations, let alone multi-agency stakeholder situations uh, where they're trying to share information. 
one of the major vectors in all of this is, is around public uh, visualization because most of these things need to go to public comment um, and getting people to understand it at a local level, um, getting people to understand what's happening to their landscapes uh, and, and what is possible is, is something that's strictly sort of not happening. Um, they do it in, in small forums um, and it's, uh, it's not going well. Um, one of the one of the challenges is, is for them is like how do we get this data moved around? How do we start to produce things, artifacts, um, shared information, sets of information, in order to expedite these processes? Um, and that these these sort of treatments, if you will, to help with resilient landscapes is really about trade offs at the end of the day. And I'm going to get in a, quite a bit more on that in a second here. Um, so what's really needed in this situation is, is decision support tools that really fully explain the trade-offs that you're making, uh, whether it's a local level or state level, uh, all of the scales in between. Um, the increased um, comprehension for everyone, so back to this sort of community level, helping people to understand uh, what's at stake, be, uh, allowing people to see the data, um, allowing them to see the analytics, bringing people along for that journey. Um, and there's people all up and down the food chain in terms of their capabilities, their ability to process the information. So how do you begin to do some of those things? Um, uh, some of the project planning, monitoring tools, um, like I was just saying, uh, the, these folks, um, some people are very far removed from technology. Um, they've never really used it. How do, you, how do you accommodate for those things? And you can, you can sort of feel the complexity building. The more information that, that, we, that we gathered, the more complex it all started to get. Uh, how do you begin to build dashboards that can sort of explain to people quickly what ecological health really looks like uh, and how we're doing? Which brings me around to ecosystem resilience. One of the people that I encountered in this journey was a, a woman named Pat Manley who works for the U.S. Forest Service. And uh, over the course of a pretty long period of time, she and a number of other scientists came together to build something called the Framework of Resilience. Um, and what came to me was uh, this incredibly long spreadsheet of all of these different vectors, all of these different ways of looking at what resilience really looks like across a landscape. And then it's everything from economic diversity, wetland integrity, biodiversity, I, you can read. Um, but, the, but the upshot of all of these things is for each one of these sort of views of what resiliency looks like, there's just an incredible mountain of data. And so they rolled this up into one picture and we created a visualization for them which they're still using, which was just sort of a side benefit to this project, just to be able to sort of further their thinking and make it a little bit more visual and easier to understand. There's a lot of depth there that I'm gonna skip for, for time's sake. So how do you design systems around this? Um, the original concept around this was something that we were calling elemental. Um, and it was, it was conceived as one piece, it was conceived as one platform that allowed uh, these visualizations to take place at all of these various scales. Um, I could talk for a day about what this really was, but I, I can't. Um, so uh, scale, uh, this is an incredibly important piece of this, and I didn't have my head around this when we first got started on this. But the data changes dramatically. Uh, when you look at it from a, a stand or a house level, all the way through a, a, like a town, through a forest or a, a county, through a watershed, regional, statewide, national, global, you get the idea. But the kinds of people that are involved and the effects from one thing to the next sort of ladder up. And so the complexity just goes through the, through the roof. It goes exponential effectively when you're trying to solve problems around this. The other piece of this is uh, there's a lot of participants that are necessary in order to really fulfill on a promise here. And so whether that's the scientists themselves or people who are on the ground actually doing land burns, uh, doing all of the planning, people in industry, as we know, the insurance situation is out of control. How do you involve them so that they understand and can communicate uh, the policymakers and the general public who really need to be more involved in all of this? And so here's a little bit of a boring part. The, the idea was that you build individual pieces of this that are relevant to those audiences in order to create the value to get them in there. And so it's the same sets of tools and uh, it, it, visualizations, data layers, they're just shown in different ways. And so how that manifests itself are things like there are people who are very deep down the rabbit hole on NEPA and CEQA planning. You can show the things that are directly relevant to them um, by using the same set of data, but showing it differently. 
Um, down at the local level of where I live, so what are the things that are relevant at a community level? How do you show the data layers and visualizations that are going to be meaningful to them? How do you include other information to make sure the value is high enough um, that they'll engage with it um, uh, in, in order to guarantee their participation? Things like WUI risk assessment, and then finally land tender, which is the piece that actually out of this has been built so far. So one package out of what we had conceived there uh, actually uh, has been manifest. And so land tender is uh, a lot about collaboration and, and workflow. Um, and very quickly, uh, you know, kind of harkening back to what I was saying at the beginning of this, uh, making sure that you can make this, uh, the planning and monitoring and uh, the collaboration uh, easy to all people at all levels. Um, we created some dashboards that allowed you to see your projects, what are the news and events that are relevant to me, uh, communication with those other folks, information about that's relevant to sort of my view of the world down to the project level, right? So where are we on a, on a North Yuba project is the example here. Where are we in this time frame? What are the next steps? What are the updates? What are the relevant documents? What's happening on that landscape from a data perspective? What's the relevant media? Who are the team members? Being able to do that sort of at a glance, making it user friendly, um, it was, is really the intent there. So how do we show what resilience uh, looks like to all of these folks? Again, back to the information dashboards and increasing comprehension. So we, were, we took this, uh, this piece that we designed just to be nice um, and actually started to use it, uh, I guess the side benefit of being nice occasionally. Um, and so we, we started to port it into the actual interface itself for this platform. And so what you're seeing there on the right side is uh, sort of our interpretation and uh, feeding the data into something that's sort of at a glance. What's the health overall of this stand, of this uh, watershed, of this state, uh, what have you, at all of these different scales uh, across all of these different pillars of resilience. And so you can continue to drill down on any one of these things uh, depending on who you are and what you're trying to achieve. Um, and so the, the views within the interface allow you to uh, highlight different areas and, and get a sense of what's happening in a landscape. Um, so trade-offs, obviously a huge ordeal um, across this as everyone's got different interests uh, along those lines. So how do you begin to represent that from a platform perspective? And so in this view of things, what you're seeing is the, the pillars of resilience on the lower part of this screen. And you're able then to drag, uh, what, uh, in this situation, what's the forest structure. And so these sliders allow you to play with different models of how that will uh, affect the landscape. And what you're seeing in the upper portion is it's a five-year time scale. So what happens in forest resilience or carbon sequestration or fire dynamics or wa water yield based on what you're doing with these, with these areas? Um, the other thing, it came up regularly over other talks, and I was vibrating. Uh, Raya talked about this a lot, is like uh, placing monetary value on things for better and for worse. It's the thing that gets people to respond. And so doing things like ecosystem valuations and showing people very visually and statistically, driven by data, what the difference is if you take action on a landscape or if you don't take action on a landscape in order to get people to act. Um, the role of AI was massive in this. You know, uh, ChatGPT didn't exist when we started to do this, but we had designed AI into this from the, the get-go, which is how do you use this data? And I, I think Ian, uh, on the, uh, yesterday morning, uh, said something about how you get them to do all of the, the AI to do all of the sort of the, the planning part of things. Like they can, they, they're better at data than we are. And so how do you use that data to um, start to drag different trade-offs, right? And so what you're seeing in the center part of the screen is the ability to sort of drag biodiversity a little higher than forest resilience and let the, let the AI figure out how, that, uh, how the treatment plan might be affected based on the priorities that you have on certain landscapes. Um, fire modeling is obviously a, a, a huge ordeal here and was the original driver for where we started with this. And so in this situation, we're using AI to uh, fire model uh, over landscapes over time. And so you can use the slider uh, as a projection over various periods of time to see what happens uh, either in a situation where you're not taking action or you are taking action. Um, and and what, how does the fire modeling show what will happen on that landscape over time? 
I, I contacted Allison Wolf, the CEO of uh, Land Tender, to find out how they actually are using AI, uh, not just a concept piece. Um, and they're using it to map vegetation at the fine scale, which is awesome. Uh, they bought a company that's uh, specifically around uh, fuels management and uh, fuels modeling. Uh, they're using AI extensively uh, uh, to model out fuelscapes. Um, they're using it as well to do 3D vegetation model, which is cool as hell. It's the combination of LiDAR satellite imagery to really be able to move in any direction to see uh, vegetation and the progression of what veg vegetation is likely to do over time. Um, and so, <laughs> uh, it, it, thank you, thank you. I actually only have two more slides, so it's, it's all right now, I'm at the end. Uh, and so uh, they're up next is, is for them to look at what the uh, treatment effectiveness is actually going to look like, right? And so AI can begin to monitor over time. You're getting snapshots and then you can begin to uh, model out uh, how, uh, how effective the treatments really are, not just the models of them. Um, and just uh, sort of, I have two more slides. Uh, land tender in numbers. So this is what happened uh, after the concept. Uh, they went and secured 17 million in funding, private-public partnership. Uh, really proud of that. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, uh, and the first installation happened in Tahoe Basin. Uh, 1.5 million acres is being, was being managed by them initially. Uh, they subsequently, as a result of that, uh, got a Series A, uh, bringing the total funding to 34 million. Uh, and now land tenders uh, um, being used to manage 7 million acres uh, larger than the state of Vermont. Um, just sort of like my, my parting thoughts with this um, to everyone, uh, please help everyone see what's at, uh, at stake. Uh, this, uh, this situation is obviously very dire. And uh, the more people we can involve and the more people we can inform, the, the better off we're going to be. Um, bringing people uh, uh, sort of at a community level, Tucker spoke about this in a great way, um, to, so that they have a shared sense of, of their values and what's important to them is, is huge in this. Um, getting people, uh, this is perfect, uh, you know, how do, how do you leverage AI um, to, to do the task, to do the data compiling, to make this uh, smarter uh, and better, uh, given how, how critical this is to move in an expedient way. Uh, and then let's inspire and equip change makers to act on this stuff and, uh, and foster regenerative uh, uh, principles within them. Thanks.